Welcome to the Kicks EAP podcast, your monthly podcast with important leaders in education from Eastern Europe, Middle East and North Africa, Central Asia, and the Asia Pacific. I'm your host, Ryan Allen, assistant professor at Chapman University here in Southern California, and my own background is in international and comparative education. Let's start the show. Today, we welcome Dr. Karma Yuta, an assistant professor in Samsted College of Education, Royal University of Bhutan. We talk about her background bridging physics and hard science with education, school and social structures in Bhutan, and the nation's gross national happiness policy. Let's jump to the show. All right, thank you for joining me today. I'm, I'm glad we can, we can finally connect and get together. I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to this conversation. Um, if we could, I, I kind of want to jump into your background because I'm, I'm fascinated as I look at, at your CV that you actually have a background in hard sciences and, and physics. And, and then now you're sort of a, a teacher trainer, or you're, you're in education. So can you maybe talk about your, your sort of early years and how you got sort of into science, but then later how that jumped to education? Uh, I, I was always interested in science and I'm also interested in science as, as of now also. And uh, initially when I, uh, my major is in physics, when I got into physics, it wasn't like um, the physics that I want to really learn. It wasn't like that. It just things happened. And uh, that was also the time because we did not have this uh, career counseling uh, session in uh, the schools and colleges I went. So we just used to go where the mass people were traveling. It was sort of like that. But then I got interested and then I and decided to go and take further up, do my honors course, do my master's and all. Then, but uh, ultimately, uh, when I was given a choice between becoming an engineering and a teacher, I opted for becoming a teacher because uh, I felt that time that I uh, can do more as a teacher than an engineer. And engineering is like hardcore thing. I felt that that wasn't really for me. So that was when I decided to be a teacher. And then I started uh, with uh, my career as a math teacher. Uh, then again, it so happened that at school I was placed in, did not have a physics teacher. So I ended up doing both physics and math. And then in my first, after my first year in the school, again, I was sent to this teacher training college. That time it was a teacher training institute. And uh, when I came here again, uh, I came as a math teacher. Again, there was no physics teacher, so it uh, looked like wherever I went, there was a dearth of physics people in there. So the, the college requested me to be a physics lecturer because I have uh, the same degree, both in maths and physics. So I did that, but in the initial year, I could find that being in two subjects and getting involved was a little bit too much for me. You are neither there nor here. So I decided that I want to stick to physics because then in maths, the college was quite comfortable with, and they had some people at least there. So then, uh, then I started doing hardcore physics teaching here, although it is a teacher training college. We started with the bachelor's of uh, education for the teachers. So for the, uh, uh, this is a four-year program where the students are also uh, taught all the things about physics that they need to know when they go to a high school to teach. So we do some hardcore physics teaching also. But now uh, the program that we had secondary program is, uh, um, we are left with the last batch. We are no longer offering it. Uh, the college decided that we will take in university graduates who has uh, done a, a degree in their subject of specialization. And then we completely focus on teacher training. So now most of my students, though they are physics teachers, I do not have to do hardcore teaching, physics teaching. I have to do some generic physics teaching, but I do not now do the hardcore teaching. I focus more on the education. And then in the process of doing the education, uh, I felt that there is a gap in the assessment practices and uh, there were not many people going for assessment practices, though it is one important component in the teacher training education. So that's when I got doing small, small works in assessment. And then I decided that 
I would like to take it up in my as part of my PhD. And that's how I ended up doing formative assessment practices, PhD, because in Bhutan, formative assessment was a big issue that time. It is still an issue. There's so much, uh, um, many things going on, but we are like still struggling to get it grounded in the formative assessment practice. Yeah, that, sound, that sounds fascinating. And I, I really relate to the idea of sort of you know, maybe not quite being sure early on in your educational journey and sort of just m moving along. You know, I, myself, I, I came from public relations and now I'm in education. It's just kind of moving around and, th and that's how you get here, I guess. I'm curious about your uh, your college, uh, the College of Education, uh, the Royal University of, of Bhutan. Can you, can you talk a little bit about the university and sort of the, the, the program that, that you're working in and I, I know that you often are advising uh, master's students. So, uh, who are who are those students, and 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 what do they what do they go on to do? Okay, thank you. Uh, in the initial years, uh, my college, as I had already informed you, it started as a small teacher training institute because that time we were always uh, having uh, people from India from, from outside. Uh, Bhutan coming and doing all the things. And then uh, the country realized that we need to also put in our people. So we uh, started as an institute and then at different, uh, I'm located in the southern part of Bhutan. So in different parts of Bhutan, we do have uh, uh, you know, uh, undergraduate programs offered, which we call it as different, different colleges. So we would have colleges which deal with uh, engineering, we would have college, which does with the uh, social sciences and so on. And our college was the only college who was doing in the teacher training institute. Uh, but now we have another one. So uh, then later on, all these uh, colleges were like, function we were all functioning under Ministry of Education only. Uh, then the, uh, it was decided that we need to put a university in place. And then we now have a Royal University of Bhutan and all the colleges are under Royal University of Bhutan. And we also have some private colleges, around two private colleges, which are also affiliated to our university, Royal University of Bhutan. And uh, because it is a small country and because there can be a uh, possibility of lots of duplications of programs. And uh, if all the colleges start uh, offering the same program, then we will not have um, it's not required for a small country also so that's when we decided that each of the colleges will specialize in our different different fields so that's where samsi college of education the college that i'm working in is specialized in teacher training and because we had two teacher training colleges we again further segregated and we said that uh, my college will look after the secondary uh, teacher training programs, any uh, teacher training programs related to secondary education only. And then my uh, sister college, which is called as Paro College of Education, it's called, uh, it completely looks after the primary teacher education program. And then they also do the uh, teacher program for the uh, Zongha teacher. Zongha is our national language. So in our schools, we also teach our national language as one big subject. So we also train teachers for that. And then our sister college is looking after that one. So, and uh, uh, the master students now, uh, as I had already said, we started with the bachelor's in the education program. And now that is no longer there because uh, many a time our, our, our graduates only, they express that uh, bachelor's degree is not enough for them to teach in higher uh, secondary schools. They can teach up to class 10, but for 11 and 12, they were filling that gap that they were not able to handle the students, the subjects and all. So that's when uh, the university decided that we will do a postgraduate teacher training program where the students uh, come with a university degree. So for the people who had never taught uh, in the schools before, who are just a fresh graduates from the university, we give them a program called as Postgraduate Diploma in Education. So which is a one and a half year program. 
with half a year of field attachment. They go through that program. And once they're done with that pro program, they are placed in various schools. And then after around like three, four, five years of teaching experience, and if somebody wants to upgrade their qualification, we invite them to do the uh, Master in Education program in our college. And the Master of Education program that our college offers is slightly different from what the other universities or other colleges may be doing. Here, though it is a Master in Education program, we do not focus only on the education side. We also do a little bit of content teaching here. And uh, then we, so basically in the MEG program that we are offering for our students is broadly divided into three parts. One is all the assessment and the pedagogies and so on. The second part is uh, focused on subject content enhancement. And then the third part is uh, research. We also felt that our teachers need to be grounded on the research skills, and then they will have to take up so many research to find out what is working in, the, in their schools, what could be done, what are not working, so which we felt through the evidence-based research, this kind of information will be very useful. So we have put a research component in that also. So that's where, uh, because I have done a PhD and my two colleagues in the physics department, they have not done a research, so I land up basically doing the supervision of my master's students' uh, dissertation. That's fantastic. I, I, you know, I also cover research methods here at my institution, so it's always nice to, to talk with someone who, who's, who's a methodologist as, as well. Maybe we can sort of hop into some of your research. You know, it seems like you have many different areas of interest, you know, obviously related to teacher training and, and pedagogy. Um, obviously, with your background in physics, you know, STEM and, and STEM education, you also have sort of quality of in, improving the quality of education. Wh which one have you really been diving into and, and thinking about recently? Yes, my research interest is very broad, but now I'm focusing more on the assessment part. And uh, uh, from the assessment also now, I am more interested into some policy related uh, practices. So I also realized that when you do policy related research, uh, it is a little bit difficult. I do not know how it is in the West because in here, uh, uh, sometimes people do not accept your paper, especially if your paper finding is such that uh, uh, it is uh, not uh, what somebody would like to hear. So sometimes I feel that people like to hear only the good things. So sometimes the uh, output of the paper is not really positive, uh, but uh, then whether people like it or not, I always feel that I'm research work that I'm doing is adding into the database and people can always use that as an evidence because research has only recently started picking up in Bhutan. Uh, even myself, uh, I actually really started to do research when I started taking up my PhD program. So before that, uh, I used to do small, small things, but uh, uh, research wasn't my part of the dream. But now we are going ahead and more and more people have started taking interest in it. But uh, we do have uh, very less people coming up to take policy related research. And that is where now uh, I try to put in myself there and uh, there are hurdles, but uh, at the end uh, you feel very satisfied that your paper is making a small impact in the country. Yeah, that, that's fascinating. I'm actually curious about that. So you talk about sort of, you know, someone might not agree or might not want to follow follow your paper. Uh, what, what, are, you, are you talking about more like people in uh, government or other, you know, universities or or I, I see you, you do some work with the ministry. So what, are there some barriers? Or what's it like working with the government there? Like, for example, uh, initially, when I did my PhD on the formative assessment, many people were not buying the idea because uh, they felt that uh, we are already doing formative assessment. Why do we need somebody to do a PhD? But then I went forward 
And then when I completed my PhD, I was asked to come to the ministry and do a presentation in the National Curriculum Conference where we get all the policy makers, the decision makers, curriculum developers, people attending the presentation. So I took as an opportunity to go up to do my paper presentation. And then before I entered in, uh, I will keep saying the same thing again and again, Bhutan being very small country, we literally know every people in here. So uh, just before I started my presentation, some of my colleagues who are working in as a curriculum officers or in the ministry and so on, they said, you are going to get lots of questions today. And then it intimidated me actually. Then I said, can you give me some hint of what kind of question you all are going to ask? They said, you wait and watch. And then they have come in a big group. So when I, after, when I did my presentation, my, one of the main findings of my PhD was that how uh, formative assessment is uh, um, understood, differently understood in the Bhutanese context. They were doing uh, summative assessment as part of, uh, they were doing continuous assessment as part of summative assessment, meaning that the whole summative assessment was broken down into small, small chunks. And then they were doing continuous assessment for that one small one. They were doing like class tests, homework, unit tests, chapter tests, and so on. So many things they were doing, but it was all summative assessment, not really formative assessment. So that was one of my findings, and I presented that how it is misunderstood. And also, uh, there were few practices of formative assessment being done in the classroom through my observation, but then this was never counted as a formative assessment. And uh, I think people um, were like, you know, they... And they were a little bit surprised to find out that what they were always thinking as formative assessment is not a formative assessment. And so they did not have any question on after that. So when I asked can, if you have any questions, uh, it would also be good for me to improve my paper. Then everybody said no question. So uh, and then I now after, over the years, and the ministry had also started working on the formative assessment practice. So um, this is one policy related uh, paper I feel I have um, been able to work on. The second one is uh, on, uh, when we had, uh, like each five years, we have a change of a government. Um, there is political parties. So five years, we have all this election and all. So each... Uh, so this time when we had uh, uh, the ruling government, the present ruling government, so when they came as a ruling government, they, uh, our class 10 students used to have a cutoff point, for example, like for them to go to class 11, they need to get certain percentage. And if they get below that, then they either go to private school or they repeat another year. So our new government came in and then they decided to remove that cutoff point they said anybody who is getting around 35% overall can go to class 11. And then uh, there were lots of noise of our students not being interested in learning because getting 35% was very easy because 20% is the, uh, again, the home assessment they have. So they need to literally work for only 15%. So just to, just to get 35. And if they get 35, they go very easily to class 11. So it was easier for them to get the 35%. So our students started becoming very, showing less interest in the study and uh, taking things for granted. So that's when we started to uh, working on a paper, the removal of a cutoff point and its impact on the students' learning. And uh, our findings pointed out that students had really lost interest in their studies. And uh, so this initiative from our paper, though it has, it was able to help the poor economically, poor families on all, but it was having a negative impact on the students' learning. So this was not received very well by the present government. And uh, there was some discussion in the parliament also. And some of my co-researchers were quite worried that our paper has reached up to that level. And then they were very worried. But then I said, this is an opportunity. Whether the paper's findings are accepted or not, if it is even discussed in the parliament, then people are reading our work. So we have done some work. So at least people are having a thought on it. 
that um, oh, they are going to give a second thought. So I said, this is what the research should be. It may be accepted, it may not be accepted. People are what people are reading and at least thinking about it. So um, this was the other policy related paper that a group of us here worked on. Wow, I love that attitude to to say yes. You know, people are reading it, and people in power are are looking at it, and that's you know the the best that we can hope for. And and maybe it'll it'll make some some positive change in 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 society. That's fantastic. I, I'm curious. Uh, you've also worked with international organizations and other development agencies. W what is it like uh, to to work with with those outside agencies? coming into uh, to Bhutan. I always thought that uh, the, the other people know more. And so when like people from the West or anybody comes to Bhutan, it's us only learning from them then. But now more and more I'm realizing and actually they have also said that it's a two way. We learn from them, but there are certain things that they also learn from us. So there is always a give and take, but uh, in, uh, I accept that we do learn more from them because they have uh, greater experiences, greater exposure and so on. So for example, like uh, I work on a project with uh, some of the faculty members at uh, in, in Sydney, Australia. So uh, we w worked on a project and then the project was quite successful. There are so many things we learned from them. But they also shared that they also learn from us. There are certain things, the practices, which they feel that is important. And similarly, when I was doing this formative assessment with the, in partnership with the Danish group, so they also said that, yes, uh, people always feel that in the West, from it's all formative assessment and there's no summative assessment. So there are some good practices in Bhutan that we need to learn from Bhutan also because not all summative assessment are also bad. So there are some good components of summative assessment. Also. So uh, I worked with these people on this project and currently uh, a big group of us in the college are working with the Nigeria and Tanzania team on a clicks program. Connected learning. We are in a STEM project, and it's a big group. But uh, there's lots of sharing and learning from there. And basically, we are looking at how the teaching uh, can be supported by I ICT and use the online platform to do it. Online uh, educational resources, how to develop that and take it to our teachers and our students. And uh, we are yet to implement it. We have finished the module designing, and, all. and they help us. Uh, it was more of uh, 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 Indians helping us because they had done a similar project before. So Tanzania, Nigeria, and Bhutan are learning from them. Yeah, I, I love to hear that, and, and and everything you just said. Actually, you know, I I think I think you're you're onto something, and and I really love to hear like you know you at, at first you thought oh we're just going to learn from these other places, but then sort of realizing that no we we have we have things to offer as well and 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 that's you know the spirit of this podcast that i also love that you're sort of cooperating with these countries uh, around the world it's not just simply western countries coming in but it sounds like you know a lot of regional partnerships and and partnerships in in africa that's wonderful if we could we're we're kind of coming to the end and you know one one thing that that I think always comes to mind for a lot of foreigners or outsiders from Bhutan, and in fact, when I told my wife I was doing this podcast, she said, "Oh, the 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 happiness, the happiness country." So we sort of have this, you know, gross national happiness index, and the country famously sort of eschewing or, or pushing back against uh, GDP growth and and this kind of thing. Can, can you maybe talk a little bit about that policy and, and how it might intersect? or connect with education and schooling? Um, or, or is this more of just kind of a, a misperception from, from outsiders? So so can you talk a little bit about that? On the gross national happiness, I think now I don't have to go into detail of how it came into being and so on, but how it is practiced in our school cases. In the beginning, I think uh, like we used to have this, some schools do that green day, no plastic day, so on. But I thought that was uh, good in itself, but difficult to practice year in, year out. And then if you initiate something and cannot continue, then sometimes the policies may fail there. 
So in our college, what we have done is we do not do it as a separate thing that today here I am doing a GNH thing. And tomorrow, no, I'm in this class, so this is no GNH. This is a GNH. So instead of doing that, what we have done at the college is we have tried to uh, embed the components of GNH wherever possible in our uh, modules that we are teaching. So we try to embed in our module. We do not teach it as a separate different thing. And I feel uh, for um, our country, as well as any other countries who would like to you know, take up some philosophy things and go forward, instead of doing it as a separate project or separate do away thing. It will always be good if you embed in your everyday practices. And um, uh, uh, the misconception by the outside world could be that just because we have this GNH philosophy, that uh, uh, then uh, the expectation is we should be um, the first GNH, the, uh, we should be in the top uh, rung of the GNH. Uh, uh, what is that one? You have this ranking, no? GNH country. Yeah, like gross national happiness or some number like that. Bhutan is never there in the top ranking. But, and, and I think our philosophy is not trying to be on the top one, but trying to be focused on the happiness then on the products. And so this is what I would like to tell to the outside world, uh, if I'm not wrong, that uh, uh, when you are practicing a philosophy, it doesn't mean that you, you can be a pioneer in it, but you are not number one in it. You are trying your best uh, to work on it. This is what I want to say. And I also like to just to add, I feel that uh, the GNH practices, uh, I would like to emphasize that should not be done as a standalone practices. It should be like immersed, uh, immersed in one's everyday practices and in the profession one is carrying out. Um, then I think the sustainability, the going forward will be huge for them. That was great. I, I really appreciate that that last message too, you know, the work you're doing is, is sounds exciting. So thank you for, for joining me today. This has been good. And this concludes our Kicks EAP podcast, which is released every first Wednesday of the month. Of course, the opinions expressed on the Kicks EAP podcast are solely those of the host and the guest. The Kix EAP podcast is made possible by Kix, which stands for Knowledge and Innovation Exchange. Kix is an initiative of the Global Partnership for Education. Globally, Kix is administered by the International Development Research Center in Canada. NORAG in Geneva hosts one of the four regional hubs of Kix. Find us on the NORAG or GPE Kix websites. You can subscribe to the Kix EAP podcast, newsletter, and webinar series and also learn about Kicks global or regional projects. Additionally, you can subscribe directly on Spotify or SoundCloud to receive notifications of the new monthly podcast episodes. Thanks for listening.